Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Um, all the cops in the back, I know it's after lunch, so if you need to get coffee or Diet Coke, let's, let's take care of it. Um, this has been my second opportunity to participate and speak here at, the, at, the, uh, at AHA Functions. Uh, last year, they graciously invited myself and uh, Deputy uh, County Attorney Laura Record, who is a prosecutor in the State vs. Hall Malecki case, to address uh, the conference last year, where we did a, a complete kind of review of the case. So they asked me back this year, which is a, a, a very much a big honor for me, and, and I'm very happy to be here today. What I talk about today is, is what I learned from this Al Maleki investigation, and I think what I learned as a whole from the notion of honor violence. And that we sat here this morning and listened to the speakers, and, and, and if you look back in the history of, uh, of these types of incidents, they're almost all exactly the same. Almost every situation, almost every investigation that you're going to conduct as investigators, as law enforcement officers, as social service people, you're going to see those telltale signs. You're going to be able to identify what's going on and how remarkably similar they are. So we're going to talk about a little bit about that. We're going to talk about what I learned from this case. Did I make mistakes during this investigation? Absolutely, I did. Would there be things that I would do differently in the future? In, different invest in, in additional investigations? Absolutely. So I want to talk about those a little bit and share those with you so hopefully that uh, you don't get placed in the same situation uh, as, as I was. Um, to be honest with you, uh, I happened to be the detective that was on call that day that caught this case. And I think we've all probably been there before. Had no idea that I'd be sitting here, you know, several years later talking about this, this topic and also being so compelled to act. Every opportunity I get, I, I try to educate law enforcement, social service workers, and the general public on this topic. In the year and a half since this case has been um, completed, uh, I've spoken to numerous groups, civic organizations, churches, law enforcement. So I try to get an opportunity every time I can to, to get out there and spread the word. Earlier this year, the, uh, the foundation asked me to be a law enforcement resource in the area of honor violence, and I humbly accepted this responsibility. The AHA Foundation is an incredible organization, and it's at the forefront of the battle against all forms of honor violence. The foundation provides education, awareness, and resources for victims of honor violence, as well as people like us that have to investigate these cases. We're just starting. This is, this is really kind of the infancy of this movement. And it's pretty cool that you all are here and have an interest in it, and it's really cool that I'm, I'm able to stand up here and, and talk to you guys about it. In the short time I've been a member of the team, I've taken about half a dozen phone calls from all over the United States regarding this issue. These calls range from law enforcement agencies investigating suspected cases of honor violences to, so, to uh, social service organizations to medical doctors. We're going to talk about a case that we worked all together here about a month ago, but just last month uh, the foundation, in concert with authorities from the state of Pennsylvania, worked to successfully save a young woman who was possibly involved in a lethal situation. Uh, pretty amazing what a couple of people were able to do in a, in a series or a span of a couple hours to, I believe, uh, save a young lady's life. Pretty amazing. As Manon told you, I'm a detective with the city of Peoria, Arizona. Peoria is a suburb of the city of Phoenix. We're a city of about 200,000 people. We border Phoenix to the west. Um, we have a large influx of immigrants from uh, all over the world uh, that have settled in the Phoenix, Arizona area. Phoenix is uh, kind of like Los Angeles Junior. Um, all the cities kind of run together. One side of the street you might be in Phoenix and the other side you might be in Peoria and, and thus and, and so forth. So we're busy. Probably not as busy as you guys are, but we stay really, really busy. Um, you know, as investigators, as people that work in this arena, we, you know, we see the results of humanity at its worst. And I think we probably all develop coping mechanisms to deal with what we d see on a daily basis. We know that victims of crimes usually fall into usually three different areas. One, a lot of times our victims, all of our victims, have done something or have a, have a lifestyle that significantly contributes to their demise. That's, what, that's the majority of our victims. You guys would probably agree with me. We have some victims that are basically victims of random acts of violence. Those are, are less frequent, but nonetheless still occur. And thirdly, 
We have innocent victims. We have innocent victims that are removed from this earth by evil, misguided people, and they've done nothing to contribute to their deaths. You know, and as, as a cop, we aggressively investigate and prosecute all homicides. I think you'd agree that when you guys get a case where you have a true and innocent victim, your drive, your desire, all of what you can do as an investigator is really intensified in cases like this. In conducting research and learning about other cases of honor violence, I'm struck by how all these cases are very similar. Every one of these cases have almost identical telltale signs. All these young women are in similar circumstances and have similar experiences in their lives, and the family dynamics are almost identical. During and after the al case, a case that I was involved in, I've been asked numerous times why this case had such an effect on me. Why did it move me the way it, way it has and it continues to do? And I came to the conclusion that there's really two reasons why this investigation kind of hit me right between the running lights. First of it was the defendant's notion of entitlement. As you talked about entitlement a little bit ago. But the defendant believed that he was entitled to commit this act. He thought it was his duty to restore his honor and his family's honor. This was due to his perception, again, his perception that his, his daughter, Noor, was living her life in an unacceptable manner. And the only way to restore that honor was to kill her. The second thing that, that, um, that really hit me is that what a double standard that that defendant had. What a double standard that all of these people have. These, these people that commit these crimes, they have a double standard. As you talked about it, they see it in the United Kingdom, we see it in the United States. 99% of these people come to the United States, come to Great Britain to escape oppression, to escape dictatorships to escape a government telling them what to do, when they can do it, how long they can do it, and all these things. They're escaping that. They come to our country then, or a Western culture, a Western country, and they commit the same acts on their own family members. It's kind of a, a tough pill for me to swallow. To me, it's kind of un-American, and I guess that's what really kind of frustrated me. You know, our defendant, Falah, he came to this country and was afforded all the freedoms this great country bestows on its citizens. He was free to live where he wanted, work where he wanted, and take advantage of our public assistance programs, which he did. While he was living in freedom, his daughter Noor was not. She was subjected to the same treatment the citizens of Iraq endured under the rule of Saddam. In effect, Falah was Noor's Saddam Hussein. Some of the things that she was um, subjected to, and these are things that you will see in every one of these cases as you investigate them. They're all going to pop up and you're going to go check the list off. She was forced to raise and take care of her younger sibling. She was the oldest female uh, sibling and, and she was forced basically to cook, clean, raise these children, pick them up from school, uh, take them to functions. She was unable to work at a job for any amount of time. She had a series of three to four jobs over a, a two-year period. And on every occasion, her mother and father would show up at the work and start harassing her. She, basically, it got to a point where the managers of these places said, hey, listen, you can't have mom and dad showing up every couple days to harass you to make sure you're doing okay. And she'd be either fired or she'd be forced to quit. You have to remember, Noor was 20 years old. She was an adult in the United States. She was 20 years old when she was killed. In spite of that, she was not able to live where she wanted to live. She couldn't live with who she wanted to live with. And basically forced, and, and, and through a series of, of psychological and physical manipulations, left and returned to the house, left and returned to the house, three to four times at least in the last year of her life. Like Nazir said, a lot of times these family members will shame them into coming home to where they want to be away, but they think that the only thing that they can do is to basically come home, and that's what happened in this case uh, several times. The other thing that uh, we learned through this investigation was that, and Azur talked about it before, was suicide and suicide attempts. 
nor was forced to uh, go to Iraq to engage in an arranged marriage. Um, her parents, her father specifically, used the guise of saying, you have a sick uh, uncle that you need to go visit in Iraq before he dies. She went over there, and there was no sick uncle. There was a man waiting for her to, to uh, go into an arranged marriage. They took her paperwork, and she was forced to live there for several months. And this was during the height of the Iraq war where bombings were frequent. We talked to several of her friends, and they would talk to Noor sometimes on the phone, and she would talk about the bombings that were happening. And one of the things that she told the, these people is when she, the bombings were happening, she would actually, instead of going to the bomb shelter, stand in the middle of the living room in the house she was staying, hoping, hoping that a bomb would strike nearby and kill her. About two, two years before our case, and remember we talk about telltale signs and things that we can um, look for before we have an ultimate tragedy. About two years before Nora's death, her father called the police department to report that Nora had stolen the family vehicle. Nora drove the vehicle every day to and from school to pick up the kids, but dad, Fala, uh, didn't like the way she was behaving, and she took the vehicle, she called us and to report the vehicle stolen. Obviously, it was a long, drawn-out investigation, but when you look at the, it was a civil matter, basically, we didn't prosecute, but if you look back at that report, which I did after this homicide occurred, there were some huge signs that I saw. At the time, you know, do we look at every auto theft? No. But dad called in and said, you know what, I'm reporting this vehicle stolen because my daughter was taking pictures with boys and she took off. I don't know where she is, so I want to report this vehicle stolen and what she's doing is bringing dishonor to my family. He tells that to the police officer that takes the report. Well, Nora went out and uh, the vehicle was eventually recovered, but it was involved in a traffic accident. She crashed the car into a light pole. Vehicles recovered, no charges were pressed, but there was some really compelling information like why Fala said what he said as far as this is, she's bringing dishonor. Well, we find out later that again, this was not an accident when she ran her car into the pool. This was an on purpose. Again, from family, or I'm sorry, from friends that we talked to during this investigation, we find out that was another attempt to take her own life. She's trying to kill herself when she wrapped her car around a pole. You know, Nora's trying to live the American dream with a foot in both cultures. Sadly, her father would not allow it. The only difference between Nora in Iraq and Nora in America was geography. She was able to come back to the United States with the promise of assisting her husband in getting to the United States and getting paperwork for him. That's when she returned. After that, things went downhill very quickly. You know, I learned a lot of things from this, this case, and, and it's going to be with me uh, professionally and personally. I faced feelings of anger and frustration during the early stages of this investigation not only at the defendant's initial act, but the actions and comments of the defendant's family in the hours, days, and weeks after the incident. I really try, to bring, try not to bring my personal feelings into this investigation, and we know sometimes that's difficult. Well, it was, it was hard for me. You know, I'm the, I'm the father of a young daughter who I treasure more than words can comprehend, and I can never understand, no matter how hard I try to wrap my mind around it, how a father could do this to a daughter. My outrage and my anger is coupled with extreme admiration for my victim, Noor, and the other surviving victim, Amal Khalaf. Noor stood up for what she believed in, and she died for it. Amal Khalaf, our surviving victim, was more of a mother and a friend to Noor than her own mother ever was. Amal Khalaf testified at our trial, and what did she get for her courage? She's completely ostracized by the Iraqi community in Phoenix. She's unable to return to Iraq, her home country, to visit, basically because she's been told if she shows up in Iraq, she will be murdered. She's lost her home. She's lost her inability 
to work because she has permanent injuries, uh, suffered uh, a broken femur, shattered pelvis, and uh, numerous other uh, injuries. When we went to trial on this case, well, let's back up for a minute. When I was assigned this case, when I rolled out to the scene, when I started looking at what we had, I said to myself, I think we have an honor violence situation here. You call it what it is, because that's what it is. The, the unique aspects of these investigations, you gotta call it what it is. We call every other type of crime whatever it is. Well, as the trial case progressed, obviously it got a lot of media attention. It got a lot of uh, play in the media, the whole notion of honor violence um, being the motive in this case. When we got to trial, and even before trial, defense tried to tell me and portray me as someone that manufactured this notion of honor violence. They said, oh, you made it all up. This wasn't an honor violence situation. This is a domestic violence situation. It's tragic, but it's not honor violence. And accused me and Ms. Record of, of, of manufacturing this notion. One thing that uh, I point to, well, there's several things that I point to. During the trial, it wasn't me, it wasn't Ms. Record that portrayed this case as an honor violence case. It was actually the words of the defendant and his wife. We intercepted or we listened to um, jail conversations that the defendant had with his wife while he was in custody awaiting trial. And again, these are his not words, not mine. Some of his quotes that he told his wife and other people that during these conversations is that an Iraqi is nothing without his honor. Maybe it's better that she died before anything worse could have happened to her. Freedom ruined Noor. And to connect it to honor and dishonor, and I don't know, whatever. You need to tell them that I'm not a criminal. I didn't kill someone randomly. I didn't break into someone's house. I didn't steal. And for an Iraqi honor is the most valuable thing. No one messed up our life except Noor. No one hates his daughter, but honor is precious, and nothing is better than honor. And we are a tribal society that we cannot change. I didn't kill someone off the street. I tried to give her a chance. I tried, but no result. And the most chilling quote that came out of this conversation is, is a statement that was uttered by Noor's mother. You rushed into it, Falah. You rushed into it. We present this stuff to the jury. Pretty compelling to support a first-degree murder conviction. He was originally charged with first-degree murder. In fact, this was a capital case in Arizona. This was, he was going to get the death penalty if he was convicted. Interestingly enough, about six months before we go to trial, out of nowhere, the decision is made to no longer pursue the death penalty. I've been a part of probably 20 or 30 capital cases in my career, and I can never remember a case where we're about to go to trial to put somebody to death gets changed to only a first-degree murder, not a capital case. Politically motivated? I think so. Political correctness run amok? I think so. So we present these statements that he makes, and as you'll see here in a little bit, the evidence that we collected at the scene, the things that we did as an investigation to the jury. Pretty compelling. The, uh, the trial lasted about a month. We called 22 witnesses. And at the conclusion of eight days of deliberation, the jury came back with a verdict of second degree murder. So not premeditated. Unbelievable. Uh, devastating. Um, frustrating. You know, we as investigators sometimes have to accept the decisions of the jury. We don't have to like them. And that's what the case here. I think what we had here was a case with our jury that, again, the same reason we, that was decided not to pursue the death penalty on Omeleki 
was the same thing that I think permeated our jury. I think the jury didn't want to be portrayed as being, again, our buzzword for the day is culturally insensitive. And I think a bigger concept that I learned from was that I think it's very difficult for American jurors or Western jurors to wrap their heads around the concept that a parent would kill their child for honor. I don't think they could, I, I, I don't think they believed that that was the motive. And the most important thing that I learned from that is that we need to educate our jurors or juries before we go to trial or we're bringing in expert witnesses to testify to juries to give them a background on what this notion is. We didn't do that in this case and I look back and I go, we should have done that because I thought everybody kind of understood it like I did. Well, obviously that wasn't the case. Anyway, like I said, he was convicted of second degree murder, uh, aggravated assault and some other charges. As a result, he was uh, sentenced to 34 and a half years in the Arizona Department of Corrections. He's 52, so basically a life sentence. May he uh, have a wonderful time in our, our prisons. Like I said, from this process, I've learned some valuable lessons and I wish to share them with you. In our case, like I told you before, we were kind of navigating blind. So hopefully my struggles, our struggles will pave the way for future successful investigations. You know, historically, I mean, everybody's talked about this this morning, earlier today. Um, we have to do a better job of educating our public. We have to do a better job of educating law enforcement. We have to do a better job of educating people that come into contact that are in these types of situations. That's what conferences like this do. That's what the AHA Foundation does. That's why it's so important that we understand the concepts. They're completely different and aside from probably any other cases that you've kind of worked. Are there parallels to domestic violence? Yes and no, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit. You know, in 2009, an article in Middle East Quarterly argues that the United States is far behind Europe in acknowledging that honor killings are a special form of domestic violence requiring special training and special programs to protect the young women and girls most likely to be the victims of such practices. The article suggests that the fear of being labeled say it all with me, culturally insensitive, often prevents government officials in the United States and the media from identifying and accurately reporting these incidents as honor killings. Failing to accurately describe this problem makes it more difficult to develop public policies to address it. One of the things the AHA Foundation is doing is researching historical cases. I think what we're going to find is that we've got a lot more instances of honor violence that have occurred in the United States, in New York City, than were originally thought, that have been labeled as domestic violence, investigated, and perhaps having a defendant convicted, but not being labeled what it really is. You know, as investigators, from a technical standpoint, how we process the crime scene, how we identify and collect evidence doesn't change in these cases. Murder is murder. Homicide is homicide. Violence is violence. That doesn't change from a technical standpoint. What does change, though, is understanding these motives that go into these cases. If you understand those motives, just like in any other type of crime that you deal with, it's going to be a lot, it's going to be very advantageous for your investigation. You know, working these cases, if you guys have ever worked gang or organized crime cases, that's what you're dealing with here. You're dealing with organized crime. You know, expect little or no cooperation from the victim's family. Expect resistance from the prosecutors, supervisors, and organizational leaders who, do, who doesn't want to see your department, your organization, portrayed as being culturally insensitive. Expect to be blatantly lied to by the family. Expect hesitant cooperation from the victim's friends. They're fearful of retribution from the victim's family or the community at large. We ran into this during the Omeleki investigation. None of her friends would come forward and testify. It was a, technical, a tactical decision that we made. We issued subpoenas. They refused to show up. Could we hold them in contempt, get a bench warrant, and drag them in front of the court? Yeah, we could have. Great character witnesses, great in, you know, circumstantial information that they could provide. 
but these young women were generally scared to death if they testified in court that they would be killed as well. So, as much as I would have loved to have them testify, their lives to me was more important. I even ran into this issue with a translator. All the conversations that the defendant had with his wife were in Arabic, so we had to go and get translators to listen to the jail calls and translate them. One of them was a linguist with the FBI in the Phoenix office. She wasn't an agent, she was a linguist. Um, she was a Christian from Basra, the same region where the Al-Malekis were from. She worked and did a lot of work for the translations and transcriptions of these calls. I served her with a subpoena and she looked at me like a deer in the headlights. She says, I can't testify. I said, you work for the FBI. She goes, I'll quit. I'm not testifying to what I heard in those tapes because they'll kill me. This is an, an employee of the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Tells you how deep it runs. Who's been in this country for 35 years? She refused to testify. Those are some of the issues that you're going to have as, as investigating these cases. I've learned many things from the, my experience in this investigation. And like I said, from the trial, I, I learned many valuable lessons. With the increased number of people moving from these regions in the United States, I believe we'll continue to experience an increase in such incidents. I also believe that research will show that the numbers of historical incidents are high, a lot higher than we thought. The keys to this issue, and we'll hit it home again, is research, education, resource development for the victims and investigators, legislation, and aggressive investigation and prosecution of the offenders. So let's get started. I know I talked for probably longer than I thought, but I have a tendency to ramble, and now I'll walk around. Uh, they're waiting for assistance. Coincidentally, I think not. Old Falal walks in. We have reason to believe that he was following them. Can't prove it in court. But of all the places in all the valley, five million people that live in Phoenix, they show up, he shows up in the same DES office that the daughter is there with. He walks into the lobby, sees that her, his daughter and Amal are there, while Noor sees her dad as well, and she starts texting with a friend. That's Mr. Al Maleki, and that's Noor on the right. These are some of the text messages that she sent to her friends. It kind of captures what her feelings are. Excuse the uh, four-letter words, but that, it is what it is. I'm so shaky. Who walks in? My dad, I'm so shaky. She's sending this to one of our witnesses that refused to testify at trial. Obviously, her friend knows the situation. He knows, or she knows, that Nora scared her dad. Everybody got a laugh out of this. But she's a prisoner even at the DES office. She can't go where she wants to. He's holding her basically prisoner there just by his presence. And obviously she has some strong feelings about her dad. But this isn't normal text messages that we're going to see from kids. You know, my daughter tells me, Dad, you're so mean, blah, 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 and I'm sure we all get that at home. This is pretty heavy-duty stuff. It also gives you a little bit of insight about the culture and where they're from. Go ahead. One of the things that we did, and one of the things that you have to do in these cases, and, and I wish I would have done more of it, after the fact, obviously, we were, we were tracking his cell phone, got cell tower locations. Now we have the ability to get GPS information and navigation in, in some cases. But we know, and this is what was presented to the jury, is we know that after he saw them the first time at that DES parking lot, he left. He drove away. We think he probably drove to the house, packed his bags, got his medication, and made the decision, today's the day. Do I think he was thinking about killing her for a long time? Absolutely. Do I think that that was the day that he decided it? Absolutely. He goes home, he comes back. His cell towers tells us that he goes about four to five miles away from the DES office, which is about the range of where his house was located. 
We know he gets back to the DES office about 48 minutes before the incident occurs because he's on his phone blowing it up. And the cell tower is about a quarter of a mile away from where the DES office that was processing those calls. So we know he's there almost an hour beforehand and not out in the parking lot where everyone could see you, but parked on the side of the building where nobody can see you. Lying in wait. We know that Noor and Amal were both very concerned about what was going on after they saw him in the, off, in the DES office. In fact, Amal goes out the front door. She's so scared that something's going to happen and looks to the left and looks to the right and looks out into the parking lot to check to see if he's there. Well, like I said, she can't see around the corner where he's parked. She goes back in and says, tells Noor, hey, the coast is clear. Let's go. Well, as Amal is going out and checking for the defendant, she locks her keys in the car. She tells us, I was so nervous and kind of scared, I locked my keys in the car. They go outside, they start walking across the parking lot to a restaurant that's in the same parking lot on a raised median, no less. And waiting for Amal's son to come pick him up. They walked, the defendant took this window of opportunity to put his foot down and races 4,000 pound Jeep at the women. And you have to remember, and you'll see the pictures, this wasn't like, hey, I'm driving through a parking lot at five miles an hour. This is, there's two women on a raised median. I have to go out of my way at probably 30 to 35 miles an hour to strike these women. Amal is struck first by the right front hood. She's tossed, basically launched about 27 feet. She is just off the curb. I'll show you where we were here. Let me keep going. Keep going. If you can imagine, this is the approximate location where Amal was standing. So this is the raised median. Nor is standing right behind her. Accident? No. Go ahead and. You can see these are photos that were taken uh, by uh, a witness uh, before we even got there. This is a mall where she has landed. And then Noor, if we go back a photo, if we can go back, can we go back? Noor's in the background there. So basically you have to think, two women walking across the, the, the parking lot, one is stepping off a raised median, Noor is still on on the raised portion of the landscaped area. Dad inputs the steering on his vehicle to the left. We have what we call, uh, you'll see, you'll see um, basically rubber deposits from, the, from the, the tire on the asphalt showing input to that area. Strikes from all, goes onto the curb and runs completely over his daughter. Norris hit basically with the center of the hood the Jeep goes over the top of her, drags her in the gravel, and then he takes off and leaves her there to die. Accident? She didn't have a chance. She didn't have a chance. We have blood on the rocks there. Um, that's how Nora was found, face down. She was run completely over. You have to remember, the whole vehicle went over the top of her. The wheels didn't, but the undercarriage did. That's where she was standing just to the right of that tree. You have the tire transfer marks on the, on the, uh, on the curb. This is the vehicle. And we'll talk about what, what, did this, what did this defendant do? If this was an accident. Everybody's awake now, right? This defendant says, oh, it was an accident. It was an accident. Did he stop? No. Did he slow down? No. Did he call 911? No. He took off. He ran. He ran. Most of our bad guys run to Mexico because of our close proximity in Phoenix. We're about, uh, about 150 miles from the border. He was over the border within about three and a half to four hours of this incident. We found his vehicle in Nogales on the Mexican side about a week later. We know that he traveled from Nogales to Hermosillo and then from Hermosillo to Mexico City. Talked about that critical speed scuff mark. You can see that 
the, the, the tire transfer where the circle is around it. So if you can imagine, that's an east-west thoroughfare through that parking lot. Peoria Avenue, which is the main road in our, in our town, is, is to the front of the picture. So most people are going to be driving on the right side to exit on Peoria. Well, we can see that he actually inputted that steering wheel enough, at enough speed to deposit a tire deposit on, on the asphalt right at those two women. He made a lot of phone calls, but none of them were to us or to 911 or anybody else. He called his wife. He called his son. He called his family members in Detroit. And he took off. Like we said, he runs south over the border to Nogales. We believe while he was in Nogales that a family member met him at the border and supplied him with, with money. Um, we did not have enough to bring charges against that. And that's another thing that we're, we'll talk about that we probably didn't do or understand the concept of is the entire family being a part of this. We certainly believe that mom had complicity in this, oldest son had complicity in this, but the entire network of people that were involved in this that facilitated his escape was much bigger than I think we realized at first and as a result probably um, didn't give everybody that was responsible for this crime locked up. And that's very frustrating to me. Because his wife is 10 times worse than he is, to be honest with you. Anyway, he takes off to Mexico, and he's able to actually get to Mexico City. Um, we had a warrant in the system for him within about 15 hours. At that time, it was aggravated assault, nor hadn't died yet. Um, but that system was in, in, it was a UFAP warrant. Obviously, the, uh, the Mexican authorities at, at their customs didn't check his status and let him board actually two planes in Mexico. He then flew to the United Kingdom. As we come to find out, the reason why he went there was because the man that Noor had previously gone into an arranged marriage with was living in Scotland at the time. He was hooking up with him. Ultimately, his goal was to get back to Iraq. British Customs looked at him and said, how much money do you have? Eh, about 400 bucks. Well, what are you here for? Um, I'm visiting uh, my son-in-law. Well, British Customs also does backgrounds on family members that they're staying with. Well, son-in-law had no job, no residency, um, and, and so basically Falah did not meet the criteria to actually come into the country. They also found the American warrant for him, and they, they placed him in protective custody um, and, and later sent him back to the United States of America, where, where we met him in Atlanta, Georgia. Norna Mali in the hospital attempting to recover from their injuries. That's uh, photos of Amal. You can see that she's got a, uh, her fracture of her femur. She's in the hair traction splint, um, broken ribs. Uh, she had a shattered pelvis. And that's Nor. Nor was horrifically injured. Uh, I don't think there was a, a, a body part that didn't suffer some sort of injury. We're talking multiple fractures. Um, breaks, abrasions, bruises, you name it, internal injuries, infection. Uh, it was just a horrific, horrific uh, death for her. She, she lived about 13 days. During that time, I, uh, I tried to get custody of her because there was legitimate thought that her family members would come to the hospital and finish the job. Mom said as much. Well, I didn't want to be, the hospital didn't want to be portrayed as culturally insensitive. The court system didn't want to be portrayed as culturally, culturally insensitive and denied my request. So I posted the SWAT, a SWAT team member at her door 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the next 13 days to ensure that brother, mother, whoever else wouldn't come in there and kill her. When she finally did pass away, my partner and I went to the hospital and actually got into a confrontation with the family who told us, you're not taking her out of here. Told them that probably wasn't going to happen, that 
we were in fact going to do whatever the hell we wanted to do because we've got a criminal investigation here, uh, it came, almost came to blows. Uh, about 10 officers had to show up at the hospital and physically restrain family members. They were not going to let us take her to the morgue. My partner and I escorted her body and stayed with it in the morgue in the hospital for over two hours until the medical examiner got there and then rode in the meat wagon to the, to the, to the medical examiner's office to ensure that nothing would happen. That's the reality of these investigations. These are the things that you've got to think about. It's not a standard DV case. It's not even a standard murder investigation. Like you said, this is stuff that organized crime does. This is stuff that organized crime, um, these are the tactics they use. They're very similar. Something that was foreign to me. I'm glad we did it that way, though. We talked about the two prior, well, we talked about the one prior incident with the vehicle with Nor, and how Dad wanted to report her as a, as a stolen vehicle and that she was dishonoring her family by having pictures with boys. That was her, that was her big no-no. The second um, incident we had occurred just two months before this incident. She was living with them all and her family. About 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, the defendant and his wife show up over at their house, pounding on the door, forced entry into the house, looking for Noor. Now remember, Noor's 20 years old. She call, Amal calls the police. Our guys roll out there. They make contact with Falah. Amal ends up not wanting to prosecute, but Falah tells our officer, I would rather spend the rest of my life in prison than to have my daughter dishonor me by living with this family. Pretty compelling stuff. Again, this was presented to the jury. All of this information was given to the jury. So we're seeing a buildup, right, of incidents. We're seeing a long simmering at least two years before the act is committed, but intensifying closer to the time of the incident. He gets shipped back to Georgia. We talked to my partner and I talked to him at the airport in Atlanta. And the first part of the interview is, it was an accident, it was an accident, it was an accident, it was an accident. As the investigation progressed, he tells me, yeah, you know what, maybe I meant to scare him. Finally, he says, yeah, you know what, I meant to hurt him. I did. I meant to hurt him. And then he uses an analogy. He uses the analogy of, of a fire in a house. He says that if you have a house and there's a fire in that house, you have to put that fire out or the entire house is going to burn down. I asked him, I said, was Nor your fire? Yeah, he shook his head. She was. That was told to the jury. Now, defense will have you believe that I made that up too. That he misunderstood what I was trying to say. He said, no, the fire analogy was actually about getting help after the fact and how we help each other out so the whole house doesn't burn down. So that's why I had family members that helped me. Well, there was no question in my mind, there was no question in my partner's mind who that fire was. It was Norn had nothing to do with the actions after the fact. He never asked me once. Never asked me once, and I can tell you it's a very long plane ride from Atlanta, Georgia to Phoenix, Arizona. He never asked me once how his daughter was doing. Never. We're listening to these phone conversations during the, uh, when he's in custody. One of his friends in, in Detroit and his wife tell him, hey, listen, your daughter died, nor died. This is his response. He said, oh. Oh. And then he talks about trying to defend himself, making it about honor, giving a mental health uh, argument uh, that he's crazy, that he didn't understand. We talked about the, uh, the calls. And here's, they're just in black and white here. This is, uh, this is what he thinks of his wife or his daughter. This is what he thinks of a mall or other victim. Bitches. They burned us. They made a mockery of us. 
A mall sealed her fate. I mean, as investigators, when we get comments like that, are we like, yes, right? Big, big slam dunker, right? We're thinking, man, this is good stuff. This is really good stuff. Nora's already gone. Shows how, what a selfish SOB this guy was, right? Nora's gone, but how about me? She didn't take the right path. He asked his family to protest before the American embassy. For an Iraqi without honor is worth nothing. And again, these are his words. These aren't my words. These aren't Laura Records' words, the prosecutor. These are, they came out of his own mouth. Like I talked about before, I was originally charged with a capital case. Death penalty was dropped. So he was charged with first degree murder, aggravated assault, and two counts of leaving a scene of an accident. We talked about our pretrial issues, witness issues, the linguist. That's what he was convicted of. Amal suffered fra fractures in her leg and pelvis. She couldn't walk for nearly six months. She's still in pain. As a result, um, she, she's probably next to, you know, I don't know who's more tragic in this case, Noor or Amal. Amal has several children as well. One of them was Noor's boyfriend, Marwan. Marwan and I had developed a, a fairly decent relationship throughout this investigation, and Marwan always had difficulty making the right decisions in life. I think this affected him. Marwan was later arrested for multiple counts of armed robbery and is currently in the Arizona Department of Corrections, serving about an 11-year term. His brother is also in the Department of Corrections for armed robbery. I talked to him, and he said, you know what, I couldn't get a job anywhere. Nobody would hire me because my mom testified at trial. He couldn't get a job. Is it an excuse to start robbing people? No, it's not. Absolutely not. But as we can see, that Amal's action didn't just affect her, it affected her entire family. She still has difficulty sleeping, nightmares, anxiety. Obviously now, with her two sons in prison, uh, it's not getting any easier for her. Nora's like a daughter and her best friend. She is a tragic figure in all this. She's a tragic figure. We've tried to help her as much as we possibly can, but it gets to a point where you can only do so much. And as we know, there's other cases that we have to work on. So why did the jury do what they did? And obviously, this isn't all the information. Like I said, if you guys want the PowerPoint for the entire trial, and investigation, I'll be more than happy to send it to you. Political correctness, not wanting to be viewed just culturally insensitive. I think really the biggest thing here, now that I reflect on it, is probably not educated enough on honor violence. And I also think one thing that really was maybe kind of a sticking point for the jury was, you know, our murder weapon wasn't a gun, it wasn't a knife, it wasn't a machete, it was a motor vehicle. And what do most people equate motor vehicles with? Accidents, right? So I think the fact that he used his Jeep as the murder weapon had an effect. I think it has influenced the jury saying, well, you know, it could have been an accident. Now, the chief argument that defense made at trial, which we had never heard before in a year and a half, was um, he was trying to spit on him. Well, he never told me that. He never said that to anybody. He never said that on any of the jail tapes, but that was their defense, that he was swerving to spit on them. So, again, I think a lot of the issues that we had with the jury was that, again, political correctness, not wanting to be culturally insensitive, the murder weapon, and not being properly educated on the notion of, of honor violence. So, they didn't see it as a first degree murder, and like I said, it, it was very, very, very disappointing. Aftermath of the trial, we received a lot of media attention during this trial, and after it. And I'll tell you, in the year and a half since we had our verdict, um, we've had an opportunity to do some, some, some good, I think, with the media. And I, don't know, I know we don't always equate media and good. 
But Fox News and CBS 48 Hours did two very outstanding shows and programs detailing that. And I'm the type of guy standing, standing here before you today that this subject needs attention. And if I have the ability to get the word out, I will. So we did get some very good media attention that kind of brought this to the forefront. I think it really did increase the awareness of the issue. I think a lot, I had a lot of people after these shows come to me and said, I have no, I had no idea that this stuff was going on. I had no idea. I mean, I go out to a, a, a social function with, the, with my wife or something, and the first thing that people ask me is, I had no idea this stuff was going on. Well, is that an opportunity for me to spread the word? Absolutely it is. Uh, something that I feel very strongly and compelled about. What do we need to do, though? What do we need to do as law enforcement, as service providers, as members of the foundation? Well, first of all, it starts right here. You guys are all here because hopefully you want to be and you want to learn about the topic. It's a great place to, to kind of network, pool our resources, bounce things off of each other. But what do we need to in the United States of America? Research, education, legislation. We need to get to the point where the UK is, I believe. This is a unique situation, a unique topic that deserves that sort of attention. Okay. What would I have done, like I said before, I probably would have now, if I have another case like this, I will introduce a subject matter expert or an expert witness to juries discuss concepts of honor violence in a general way. Before we even start presenting testimony, if I can call a witness, to say, to give the jury a general understanding of what these concepts are so they go in and understand them. Our biggest jury question was, we didn't want to offend anybody. So I would, I would definitely bring in, a, in, in a, uh, an expert witness to do that. I would work more diligently towards the indictments on family members. Um, when we had that case go on, it, the, it was a it was kind of a, a manhunt, and that's where a lot of our, our efforts went to. I think now I would have widened that net. I would, have, uh, I would have been up on pen registers or trap and traces on all their phones a lot quicker than I was. Not just the defendants, but the entire families. We talked a lot about today. How am I doing on time? Good. Honor violence versus domestic violence. Are there differences? Absolutely there's differences. Um, Azir talked a little bit about it earlier. Ayan talked about it. But what are the differences? And these come right out of the literature that you guys have got in your workbooks today. The differences between honor violence and domestic violence. And you can see they're, they're pretty different. Honor violence is committed against any family member whose behavior is de deemed to be unacceptable to the family. That can be wife, child, sibling, cousin, daughter. Most frequently though, it's the wife or the daughter. That's your target. That's your victim. And the most common suspect is father or the oldest son. I will tell you that Falah's oldest son is Falah, mini Falah, Falah Jr. Um, he had aspirations of, of going into the United Air, States Air Force. Uh, in fact, had got his paperwork in and was assigned uh, boot camp before this happened. An interesting thing happened when Air Force OSI called me about him. He's flipping burgers right now. He didn't make it. I told him that perhaps we don't want somebody like that in our Air Force. Domestic violence, the perpetrator of violence is an intimate relationship with the victim, wife, girlfriend, mother, ex-girlfriend, that sort of thing. Differences, yes. Go ahead, next one. In honor violence, multiple family or community members may be involved in a campaign of oppression and or violence against the victim. We see in all of these cases. This is a group decision that's carried out by the group. Father may be physically violent. We know when talking to friends that Nora was physically abused for a long time. Dad, dad and, and brother physically assaulted her for several years. Mother may engage in emotional manipulation and threats. We know that for a fact in our case, and you will see it in all of your cases. We saw it in the Pennsylvania case that we're going to talk about here in a little bit with the, uh, 
the Egyptian girl. Sibling may play a role in the enforcer and report back to parents. The biggest snitch Falah had as to Noor's activities was the oldest son. He would go back and tell Falah everything Noor did. Oh, she was talking to this boy at school today. Oh, no, she was talking to this guy on the phone. That was his job. He was, he was Falah's snitch. And you'll see that as well. And that's usually going to be your oldest son. Domestic violence usually involves violence committed by a single perpetrator without the support of the family or community. You guys know that working special victims. Most people don't like wife beaters. Most people don't like child beaters or child abusers. They're ostracized. It's wrong culturally from our side. You're getting full support on the honor violence side of the, of the family and of the community at large. In honor violence, our perpetrators don't believe they're committing a crime. Look, at, Listen to what he said. It's not like I killed somebody off the street. I didn't steal anything. They believe their conduct's warranted and even required because of the victim's behavior and this attitude is supported by deeply held cultural and religious beliefs. And I think Nazir made a a really, really awesome comment when he said, this isn't a cultural issue or a religious issue, it's a human rights issue. And when he said that, the light bulb kind of went off in my head and I said, yeah, you know what? I, I, I'm not as eloquent as he is, so the way I look at it is, murder's murder, what's right is right, and what's wrong is wrong. And that kind of crosses over all cultural lines and all religious lines. You guys know that perpetrators of DV are typically understand that they're committing a crime. They know they're not supposed to slap the wife around. They know that. And they should feel, and a lot of them feel guilty and remorse, and that's our whole cycle of violence that we all know about. That doesn't happen in honor violence. His conduct's justified by the victim's behavior, it's supported by family members, and he's celebrated for his actions. You hear about cases where they go back to the home country and they're treated like royalty because they did what they needed to do. It's kind of disgusting, but it's true. Time Magazine did an article on, on this case. and they, they went to a local mosque in Phoenix and asked the parishioners about this case. About 80% of them agreed with what Law did. And believed that Noor was living her life in a dishonorable way. And the only way to correct that was to kill her. That's pretty scary stuff. That's happening in any town in USA. Obviously in DV, they're, they're not going to get the support of the family or the victim's family. It's not condoned. And they'll go to great lengths to uh, hide that behavior. A victim of honor violence is likely to be shunned by family and community because of her dishonorable behavior. She may feel she deserves the abuse. And there's immense pressure to change her behavior to bring uh, peace and to restore honor. A lot of these girls shame themselves into returning to their families, which ultimately seals their fate. And we've heard that over and over and over again today. Obviously, DV victims and, and, uh, aren't that same way. Um, we've made ex you know, extensive strides for resources for victims of domestic violence, uh, charging enhancements, sentencing enhancements, all of those things that, that we've done for DV uh, victims in the last 10 to 15 years in the United States, we need to look at implementing for victims of honor violence. That's legislation, that's education, that's getting um, programs in place to help these young ladies out. Believe your victim. Talked about that earlier. If a young lady comes to you and says, my dad's going to kill me, he is. Now, we hear American kids say, oh, my dad's going to kill me because I got an F. Do we take that with a grain of salt? Yes. When you have a situation like that, and the hardest thing for these young ladies to do is to step forward and say, I need help. I'm in danger. If they've done that, you're halfway there. The last thing you want to do, though, like we talked about earlier, is send them back into that environment. Because it will not end well. It will not end well. 
Like I said, the simple fact that they confide you, they trust you, is a humongous step. They know. They know by coming forward and, and talking to police, talking to social services folks, they are putting themselves in a very dangerous spot. Don't allow that victim to go home. If we have to place them, we have to place them. Scene investigations, again, like what we talked about before as investigators, we're not going to process the crime scene any differently than we would on any other crime scene. But however, really pay special attention to computers, cell phones, written documents, photographs, videos. There was a, one of the things that was circulating around this investigation with Norma Malecki is that there was a tape of the wedding in Iraq. We never found it. But a lot of people alluded to the fact that there was a tape of her being married while in Iraq. We were never really able to locate that. Um, lock that scene down, lock that house down as quickly as you can, search warrant considerations and that sort of thing. Uh, get as much evidence as you can early on because it's going to disappear. You give these folks any amount of time, things are going to walk. Um, obviously, financial records, interviews, of course, as we know as investigators, they're all recorded. They're one-on-one. -on -one. Don't try to interview these folks um, as a group. It really ends very badly. Um, you pick the location. My partner and I went over to try to talk while Falah was still on the run. My, my partner and I went over and tried to talk to Ali, who was the son, and uh, at his home. It ended up, because we were in plain clothes, with a neighbor calling the Glendale Police Department, which was in an adjoining city, saying that there was a fight across the street. That's how heated it got, because mom comes out and starts screaming at us, throwing her shoe at us, spitting on us. It was pointless. We couldn't, we couldn't really do a whole lot. So get them early, get them locked in, because if you get them locked in earlier, obviously, if you can find out and prove that they're lying down the road, charge them. Charge them. Family members are almost always complicit and have direct knowledge about the incident, and then sometimes they actively participate. They almost always assist or facilitate the suspect's escape. One of the things that we did very early on in our investigation was conventional and non-conventional surveillance. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court has made it a little bit more difficult for us to put trackers on vehicles, as we all know. We used to be able to slap them on there anytime we wanted. Now we have to get uh, a search warrant. But I wish we would have expanded that. I wish we would have continued that in place longer. I know, I know that somebody from that family went to the border and met Falah and gave him about $1,000 in, in currency. Don't know who it was. Better surveillance, longer surveillance would have probably helped us out in that. Obviously, we're going to want to get complete histories on all persons that are involved, prior police contacts and reports. That was really invaluable in our case. Those two prior incidents really, really kind of locked us into that first degree charge. We fought and fought and fought to get those in um, in pretrial motions, and we were able to get that, that in. So anything, any sort of incident that's remotely involved in the one you're currently investigating, it's very important to obtain. Check with adjoining jurisdictions, uh, precincts, uh, boroughs in your case. Um, do they have history? These folks have a tendency to move around a lot. Um, I think the Almalekis lived in about three or four different homes in about a three or four year period. They move around a lot, different cities, different areas. Um, check with social services and CPS. Are there any, any open cases with these people? Not maybe just for your victim, but maybe some of the other children. Follow up at schools. We talked about this. You know, in our case, um, we didn't have this, but is there a time where they're gone for an entire semester? And now they're back. You probably know what's going on from that, right? All this is like building your case. Um, family associations, relatives, employment uh, records. Social media. How many people have we now put in jail because of what they say on Facebook? I mean, isn't it a great resource for us now as, as cops? People will say and do anything on Facebook or Twitter or whatever else. In this case, and we didn't get this in because we, we argued it, but they wouldn't let us get it in, nor had a MySpace account. And I was able to obtain all the content of that. There was 
messages between Noor and Falah. Falah actually was posing as Noor's uh, younger sister, but you could tell it was him. He tells her, I'm going to kill you. About a week and a half before this happens. We didn't get that in. They said, well, you know, you can't prove it was him that said it. Well, she calls him by name. A term of endearment that she calls her father. He tells her in so many words, you're dead. How can you continue to dishonor this family? How can you live the way your life? I've let you back in. You leave, you leave, you leave. What do you want me to do? Kill you? But, again, something that, that is a resource that we can use as law enforcement, as social services, to get those records, because a lot of times they have a lot of really, really good information in it. If you've got a guy on the run, alert Border Patrol as soon as you can. Um, that's one of the first things we do in Arizona. Everybody runs south. Check their visa status. Do they have dual citizenship? Are they United States citizens? Could that be an issue? Absolutely. Okay. Um, in our case, all the all Malekis were U.S. citizens. Um, very recent U.S. citizens. They'd been in the country about 15 years, but uh, had recently, he was recently um, a citizen. Check their passport status and use. Get that going as soon as you possibly can. I'll tell you what, these people are gone and they are gone. Uh, we got lucky. We got very lucky with Falah because ultimately he was trying to get back to Iraq and we wouldn't have got him back from there. Get your warrant in that system as soon as you can. Get, get some teeth in that thing and think about getting uh, a UFAP warrant, unlawful flight to avoid prosecution warrant in as soon as you can. Talk about uh, other things, surveillance cameras, license plate readers, traffic cameras. Um, a lot of stuff now is being recorded and it can only not only kind of detail our case as far as where these people went uh, after the crime, but also before. We didn't have that in this case. We didn't have any, uh, you would think that a government building would be equipped with surveillance cameras. None, not one. None in the lobby, none in the parking lot, nothing. So that would have been really helpful in our case, but we just didn't have it. But please check, make sure you check. Um, Cell phones, big thing, you know, every one of our cases, you guys know, first thing we're looking at a lot of times, cell phones. And cell phones have come a long way in the information that we get just in a short period of time. Call detail records, GPS coordinates, cell tower locations, and then do we need to talk about pen registry or trap and trace, or even in some cases getting wiretaps going. I don't know how easy it is to get a wiretap in New York City. It's not real easy in Phoenix. Um, it's it's kind of tough. Uh, and the cost is, is uh, pretty prohibitive. Witnesses, like we talked about, they're not going to want to talk to you. They're not going to respond to a subpoena. They're not always reliable. Um, you're going to find out that you're going to have to babysit these witnesses. You're going to have to drive them to and from court. You're going to have to drive them to and from defense interviews. They just, you got to almost be kind of like holding them by the hand all the time. We spent a lot of time doing this, tracking witnesses down, getting them to interviews, getting them to appointments, uh, and making sure that that, that was all taken care of. Um, get those jail phone calls. Man, those things were huge in this case. Obviously, I think it, it, it kind of, for us, sealed the deal on a first degree uh, murder conviction, but obviously our juries didn't think that. But get them, they're so important. You know, they tell you, hey, this phone call is being recorded, and you know as well as I do, these guys will keep talking. Nine times out of 10, they'll say something to jam themselves up. Intercept their mail if you can. Talk to jail intelligence officers and continue to monitor that family, whether it's, like I said, conventionally or non-conventionally. Trial preparation. You're going to get resistance from calling in honor violence. It's going to happen. And, and hopefully, conferences like this, the fact that we're getting the word out, will kind of change that mentality that we have that seems to be going on. Are you going to pursue a theme or motive-driven argument? Are we going to use honor violence as our cornerstone? Is that what we're going to argue in this case? You've got to make a tactical decision, you and the prosecutor, if that's the, 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 the tactic you're going to use. We talked about earlier, call a subject matter expert or an expert witness to explain honor violence to your jury. You're not alone. Call me if you need help. This is my contact information. I am by no means an expert. I was baptized by fire, and I've taken a really active interest in this topic. I think it's important. I think it's um, one of the most important things that we're going to be faced with 
as a law enforcement, as a social service provider um, in the next 15 to 20 years. Um, since I've been a part of this, we had a case, uh, when was it, in the end of August, September? We get a call from a medical doctor at the foundation did. She was um, treating a 16-year-old young lady from Egypt who was pregnant. She was about eight months pregnant. And during the examination, her mother, or prior to that, mother had brought her in because she was complaining of stomach pain. Mother had no idea daughter was pregnant. They brought her in, and I later find out, though, that the daughter had previously been in to this clinic and about six months prior, and she was told that she was pregnant, but she had hid this from her parents. Mom had no idea. Dad had no idea. She was actually, she went to the extent of, of faking her, her monthly period every month because her mother would check. Well, they go in there, and the doctor drops the bomb, saying that, yeah, she's pregnant. Mom immediately gets up and says, I can't, you can't live with us. You can't come home. You've dishonored the family. Your father, I cannot protect you from your father. The young lady says, my dad will kill me. He will kill me. Well, thankfully, this doctor took it upon herself to call us, call the foundation and called social services. This was about a, what, a three-day process that we went through on this? Or longer? Yeah, about three days. Initially, social, social services was going to take custody of her, and the caseworker actually uh, had some knowledge about this stuff, this, this topic, and took an active interest and really tried to get this gal placed somewhere. Well, do you know what her supervisor said? Don't get involved. We don't want to be seen as culturally insensitive. And they actually ended up, and correct me if I'm wrong, she was first placed in a shelter, and then they told her, well, there's nothing wrong with her. Send her back to the house. So they, they, tried to, they tried to admit her to the hospital. That's right. And they, sent her, they said, no, we can't put her in the hospital. And then ACS said, there's no history of violence. Right. So they called the mother, who disowned her, and had her removed. Right. So. She was, she was going to the hospital. The doc, the, they said, oh, the only, other than being pregnant, there's nothing wrong with her. Social services would not take her and place her. So what do they do? They sent her home. Well, we get a call from the doctor saying, I think I might have just sentenced this girl to death. What do we do? What can I do? Well, we got involved, and I made some phone calls back to law enforcement back there. And what ended up actually happening was... Um, the doctor, I told the doctor, hey, listen, you know what? You can make an anonymous phone call to that law enforcement agency. Have them go out to the house and do a welfare check. Well, thank God that they did. Because when they got there, there was a fairly large domestic disturbance going on. And the girl basically had threatened to commit suicide and kill herself. They got there in the nick of time. And they were able to get her out of there and place her in a, first a medical, psychological uh, facility and now she's getting some uh, help and some assistance in, in dealing with um, what's going on in her life. Do I have any doubt in my mind or anybody that was a part of that have any doubt in their mind that that young lady A would either have been killed by her father or B committed suicide that day if somebody wouldn't have intervened? Absolutely. She'd be dead. She'd be dead. That's the power. That's the power that we have. That's the power that knowledge. One doctor in a small town in Pennsylvania thought, this ain't right. Who can I call? Aha. Uh -huh. That's pretty amazing. That's powerful. And that's why I stand before you today. And I will stand before you anytime these guys will give me an opportunity to do so to tell you how important this is. Again, it's all about education. It's all about knowing where to look for help. It's all about knowing where to direct your victims. And what we have to do as responsibility to these victims is develop programs and legislation in the United States of America that protects them, that ensures that investigations are conducted, and that when prosecutions need to be done, they are done so aggressively and effectively. So 
If you guys have any questions, if you get a, an investigation where you might need some input, please call me. Um, that cell phone's on 24 hours, seven days a week. It's not like I don't get enough calls as it is. But anytime somebody wants to talk or call, if they want some more resources, some more training, or, um, anything that I can do for you guys, please, please, please don't hesitate to call us or the foundation. And, you know, again, it's been my honor to talk to you guys today, to be before you, have them ask me back for a second year. Again, an amazing experience. You guys should be commended for spending time today, taking time out of your busy schedules, out of your caseloads, guys, I know, uh, to come here and, and, and hopefully you come away from this with a little bit more knowledge. And again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.